you're live. Hey, hey. welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. I feel like this is going to be, I don't really know where this conversation is going to go because there's a lot of interesting yeah. interesting stuff we've already been talking about. Right. But let's um, let's start out with acting. Okay. Just to kind of continue on with the, the ones that we've had so far. So I've only heard that you have acting experience. You've right. told me, hey, if you have a short film role or something like yeah. that, let me know. Yeah. But I don't know anything else other than that. Yeah. And obviously, as people can hear right now, you have this great like stage voice, like yeah. theater voice. Yeah. People you know? say that. Can you sing? I well? hate it. Oh, you do? Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's one of those things where, you know, you hear your own voice recorded and I've just never liked it. Wow. Uh, you know, it's whatever, you know. I think everybody um, feels that way. But yeah. if you have a voice that sounds like Literally, you can play like the voice of God or something yeah. like yeah. Zeus or like this uh, yeah. like, like big <laughs> James Earl Jones or somebody like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So can you sing? No, I, you know, I'm, I, in fact, I stink at it. And I, it's something that I've here recently decided I'm going to tackle and try and do because I can play guitar and, and it's just so fun you know, to be able to play and sing a song, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like Chase does. I love, you know, how Chase, I mean, he can get up on a stage and just play guitar and sing and right. it's great. You know, he can just like rock the house by himself. Right. Um, and if I could just sing, you know, I, so I'm going to try it. I'm going to try and just work at it. You know, I know enough about like the technique and you know, that I could probably just try and teach myself and whatever. That's amazing. So I'm going to try and we'll see what happens, yeah. you know, and <laughs> just play guitar and record some songs. I've got a list that I'm going to work on. That's so, awesome. So you're yeah. going to write your own stuff too? No, I, you know, I don't really care about that. I just want to be able to play songs okay. and sing, you know? Um, and so I've got a list that I'm, I've, I'm, I can play on guitar. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to just try and teach myself to sing the songs and get better and better right. at singing the songs and see how good I can get at it. That's know? awesome. Yeah. So you have that, that seems like kind of a hobby. Yeah. And then, yeah. which we'll probably end up talking about this, but you are uh, a math teacher. Yeah, that's right. And you've taught high school and now you're teaching college. Yes, that's okay. right. Okay. Yeah. So you're legit, like your, your mind is very expansive, yeah. but let's start with acting. Yeah, so okay. where, where did that whole thing Well, start? that, that just happened uh, in junior high. Um, we had, we were fortunate enough that we had a drama class and the teacher was really, really good. And so, um, you know, in one year, I mean, we did, we did it. It was three plays that we did full length. I mean, they were like, you know, hour and 20 minute plays, wow. you know? And so, um, I mean, drama class, it was no, it was no kidding around. I mean, you came to drama class, you're learning lines, you're, and she taught you how to act. I mean, she really taught you the methodology. Um, you know, she forced you to do things, um, to learn, you know, how to act. And I seemed to be a natural at it. And so in, in all the plays I got the, the, for the male part, I got the leading role nice. in all the plays. So, <laughs> and I got a little, I won a trophy at the end of the year and everything. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it was, it's really been an advantage in life, you know, being in ministry. Um, one of the things that it does for you with public speaking is it allows you to, um, be transparent in terms of the emotions that you're feeling. So in, in acting, you know, really good acting is when a person can sort of get in touch with the character and what that character would be feeling and then, and then display those emotions. And, and that's probably the hardest part of acting of good acting is being able to uh, allow those emotions to be there for everyone to see, you know, um, and just do that. But it's very powerful too. And mm -hmm. so same thing, you know, for public speaking, if you can allow yourself to tear up, if you can allow yourself to show some anger, you know, about an injustice you're talking about or whatever, it, mm -hmm. it brings a lot more passion, you know, and, and acting so allowed me to do that, you know, right. so it was, it was a great experience. I know? just read a quote that said, when you show your soul, people will listen. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like that's so totally. true. Yes. So what, like in drama class, what would you say, like, when did it start clicking? Cause you said you're a natural, but when yeah. was, did you, do you remember the first time you cried or the first time you did something that you were like, Oh, this is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, you know, well, she made us do these exercises that were, you know, like difficult, you know? Um, and she did one that was that, you know, I think if the administration had found out that she did this, they would not have been happy. Uh oh, what was it? Well, she, what she did is there was this, you know, pretty girl in the class and she wanted to be an actress and everything, you know? And so, um, what she did is, um, she, she took this girl and she got this like mask that, um, 
when she put the mask on, it was a real realistic looking mask, but it made her look like she had been burned badly. Mm-hmm. It was almost like something you'd wear for Halloween, you mm-hmm. know? And it was ugly. I mean, it's really, really ugly, yeah. you know? And um, so she had her put it on and she said, um, and she was actually, I was the one she was using as the male part. Mm-hmm. She put, she made this girl put on the mask and she said, now make him attracted to you. <gasps> You know, and so, you know, and she said, and she said, if you really, if you want to try and get good at acting, and she was saying this to this girl, she said, you know, they got those fat suits or whatever, and it makes you look overweight. And, you know, she said, put one of those on, you know, because this girl's used to everyone buying for, she said, put one of those on and go out in public where nobody knows you and try and pick up a guy. Wow. You know, so it was really interesting. It's like, how could you, could you allure someone with your whatever, right. you know, and, and so that was like an acting thing for her. But, um, for me, it just, I noticed that the material, like if the material had a character going through something that was difficult or whatever, I, I don't know. It just seemed to, I naturally felt what that character was feeling. And then, um, and then the hard part was allowing yourself you know, either to cry or whatever. And yeah, I mean, I did it in, in drama class. And the first time I did it, we were doing this scene like it was a, a guy from Vietnam who was suffering from, you know, the, what is it? I can't remember the, when they um, have stress from PTSD. P, yeah, PTSD. Mm-hmm. And, and so I was, I was supposed to be playing this part where I was, I was angry and I was yelling and, and started crying. And, and so I, I did it and I started crying during the scene and that was just in front of the class. And yeah, that was, that was hard. It was like, but then <clears throat> As I was doing it, you know, it felt weird. It's like, wow, it fe- you feel really vulnerable. It's right. a, you know, but then as soon as I was done, there's like, you know, there's 20 kids in the class and the scene was over. All of a sudden they all started applauding and I looked up and a bunch of them were crying. Oh, wow. And so when that, when that happened, I was like, I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. You know? And so then I, I don't know. I just, I was never afraid of it after that, you okay. know? So so the first yeah. time you felt like there was some sort of connection yeah. that you portrayed this thing accurately and it right. touched people as well. Right. Right. I wonder if that's cause that's, that's like performing in front of people live. Yeah. I wonder if actors in film get that same kind of feeling Yeah. because you know, you perform, you put it out there and then it's up to the editor and the director right. to go place, the, you know, puzzle piece it all together. And at the end of the day, maybe you, t- you had a really good take where you were crying and it was yeah, really right. good, but then they chose the other one you're like, what? Yeah. So have you ever experienced a failure where you were up on stage and you went, uh oh, this is this isn't yeah, what I wanted to do? No, no, honestly. Really? That, yeah, it never I'm always able to make the connection, you know. Um, in fact, just just now when I was telling you about that scene and remembering I felt myself almost tearing up just a little bit, like I kinda had to hold you know, yeah. it just for some reason I it, it just naturally that naturally happens. And I've never done any acting like, you know, that was filmed where they have to do takes and cuts, you know, but I know some people who have, and, and they've also done theater. And it's interesting because they say that, you know, like the cuts, you know, and having to redo a scene and that that does make it difficult right. because then they have to regenerate you know, over and over again, that same emotion. Um, and that that can be very, very hard, right. you know? And, and the other thing, and I didn't really realize this, but Apparently, when you're filming, when you're making movies or whatever, they will sometimes like do scenes that are way, they'll do them out of sequence. Yeah. And so you're doing this scene and it's just, you did a scene this morning that was in some other place in the story and right. now you're doing it in another place in the story and you have to kind of get into the character oh, from yeah. two different places. Whereas when you're on stage, it you're doing the story from beginning to end right. and it feels natural that way. So, um, and it's kind of like a one shot. Right. That's right. There's no, there's no saying cut during a play. Right. You know, so the only, the only time you get a break is if they're doing a scene that you're not in and you're behind, you're backstage or right. whatever. So, um, to me, I mean, that's all I've ever done, but to me that would, that seems easier. It seems like, 
you know, right. doing I, the other thing. I would say it's it's definitely, and I definitely see that side of things. And I feel like there are the people who like the idea of, let me try that again. So I feel yeah. like it is two different worlds sure, kind right, of, which is why, right. and a lot of people think, oh, actor, like you can do theater on stage. You can do movies, whatever. Like Hugh Jackman, right. someone who has done Broadway and he's done films. Right. That is a really, really interesting thing for someone yeah. to have both of those things and to be good at both of right. those things. Um, but what was interesting about you saying that you kind of connected back to that moment, um, you talked about Chase a second ago. So when he was in Grave Robber, the musical mm-hmm. we did, um, he anytime he watches specific scenes where he, like there was one song where he had to be emotional yeah. and he had practiced to that scene and he really got himself to be able to like actually tear up and everything. Right. And he's like, I literally can't watch that without tearing up now. Yeah. And he's like, he could be having a great happy day. And then that just triggers him back to that yeah, moment. Sure. So would you say that you, cause you say it's natural, but there has to be something that's going on below the surface. So what would you say is that thing that you do in order to understand that character and to be able to bring that out of yourself? That's a good question, you know, and, and honestly, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. It, it's, um, all, you know, all I know is, is that, you know, when I, I read, um, a scene, you know, um, and, and this character is just in a place where, um, there would just naturally be emotion. It just seems like, um, I can just feel that emotion. It's what it feels like. It just feels like I can just sort of put myself in their shoes and be that person for a moment. Um, and it just feels real, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so like the, when I, the first time I ever did that scene in mm-hmm. class, you know, um, for some reason it was, I was just able to feel, um, the frustration of that character who, um, could not move forward in their life because of of the trauma that they experienced in a war when they were 19 years old and and now they the character at that point was like 50 you know like my age now you know and he was unable to move forward in his life and and that was just um that was just so profoundly sad to me you know and i just felt it i i, I don't know how to um, do you just feel like you're really empathetic and that's why you can put yourself in someone else's shoes you know i guess um you know, in ministry, I've done a lot of counseling and it it seems like in counseling, I can, I can feel that too. Um, but my emotions don't take over there, you know, um, I guess there's just something about, there's something about saying, okay, the, the job that I'm doing right now is to portray this person as this person. Right. It seems like there's a responsibility there that when you take on that responsibility, there's just something that clicks in me anyway Mm -hmm. that says, okay, now I'm that person and I need to let those emotions be there. So it it feels, I don't know if it's, it's all empathy for the character as, as much as it is empathy and the importance of telling that character's story. You know, Mm -hmm. that's important. Like the quote, you know, if you let your, what was it? You let your soul. Yep. When you show your soul, people listen, people listen. And, and it, when it's important for people to listen, there's a responsibility there, you know? So So. I would say you're a storyteller then. Yeah, maybe so. Right. Yes. You see the importance of people getting it and you're like, if it's on me in order to portray this thing accurately, if it's on me, if I don't do this right, then people aren't going to hear the story. That's right. Okay. So, and what's interesting is, um, David who I've had on before, he says that there's elements of that. Sometimes the character that just happens for you. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you pull from your own life and you think, okay, this is a, like you in school, you were playing a 50 year old. So yeah, like right. you were not there in your own That's life. That's right. Yes. But he was like, sometimes you can say, okay, have I ever felt like I can't move forward? Maybe not mm-hmm. as a 50 year old, but have I ever felt that at all? Right. And I feel like there's, that's why a lot of times actors kind of have crazy lives because they're almost open to being hurt or being, yeah. you know, having <laughs> these traumas that happen because right. then they have a toolbox. They have something, okay, now I have this experience. So would you say, even if you're not an actor, would you say that it's healthy to have an, uh, some sort of a channel to let those stories out of you? Like Casey Affleck, mm-hmm. they asked him, did you ever see um, Manchester by the Sea? I don't think I've seen that, no. Such a sad movie. But he fully embodied this just like tragic character and grew a beard and just he looked horrible. And at the um, award shows, people were like, 
why did you do that? Like, why, why would you play that kind of character? Like, are mm-hmm. you, do you like the pain or do you like that? And he was like, I think sometimes it's good to get that out of your system. Yeah. And that really struck me. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah. People, especially people who like you and just the storytellers, the people yeah. who love myth and they love, um, analogy and they love these like ways to tell these themes, you know, like there are themes in every movie, every movie you can watch and say, Oh, that's the hero journey. Or, Oh, that's the savior journey. Absolutely. And so you see these things and if you can identify them and plug yourself into them, I feel like that's kind of what makes you a good actor, Mm -hmm. especially if it's natural. Yeah. But would you say if you're not an actor, I mean, you've, you've, like you said, you've counseled people, you you see what people are like in the real world. Um, Do you feel like having some sort of way, maybe it's through something art artsy or creative to let those things out either it's Mm -hmm. song painting whatever that is have you seen that as like a helpful tool for people well i mean in counseling uh i I think it's definitely healthy for people to want their emotions out Mm -hmm. so you know people need to find ways to be constructively angry to cry you know, um, and so, you know, people who bottle up their emotions, you know, like the fathers did in the fifties, you know, yeah. stuff it down and, you know, <laughs> right. um, that's, you know, that's maybe why they all died at 50 of heart attacks. I yeah. don't know, but it, you know, it's definitely healthy, um, to express the range of emotions that you feel in life. Um, I think that's very healthy. And, and I think that you, you can't really, um, I don't think that a person can know themselves unless they do that. So unless they are willing to identify, you know, how they feel in life about the things that take place in their life and express those things, um, it's hard for them to really know themselves and, and to move forward, which is, you know, there's a saying among counselors, they say there's, you know, two kind of people in the world, um, those in therapy and those in denial, uh, you know, and it, it's, yeah. you know, so I think it, it's healthy to find a way, you know, whether it's with your loved ones, your, your spouse, your whoever, but it's healthy to, um, to let your emotions be shown, you know, about the things you deal with in life. So now some people, you know, um, we'll do that through art. So like musicians will, you know, write love songs. You oh, know? Yeah. I've, I've recently gone through something difficult in my own life, in my romantic life. Really? Um, yeah. And, um, for the first time in my life, I'm listening to love songs written by men. I, I, I listen to Pandora yeah. and I have like, a, it's the, the radio station is Daudry, you know, that guy, he won American Idol or something. Oh, I don't know, but Chris, he, he, yeah, he's, name? but he's Chris definitely, Daughtry. yeah, that's okay. yeah. Okay. And he won, uh, he, I guess he won American Idol, but he's, um, he, he does a lot of like love song type songs, mm-hmm. you know? And so I have a Daughtry radio that plays that kind of music. And so nice. I'm listening to all these love songs. And for the first time I'm hearing these lyrics and I'm totally identifying really? with the lyrics, you know, and I've never identified with them before. I mean, I've liked the song maybe just musically. and I just enjoy it. Um, but for the first time in my life, they're like saying things and I'm like, Oh my God, that's me. I feel <laughs> exactly that way, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's really cool, mm-hmm. you know, when people can, um, you know, with expression, with art or whatever, those who are talented enough to do it can, can do that and they can release their emotions and how they feel about something that's going on in their life. Mm -hmm. And then they can write a song about it or they can do a a, a play about it or write a movie about it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think the value of art and it connects with other people and that they can grab a hold of that and say, yeah, that's how I feel. Right. You know, that's, that's giving an articulation to what I'm feeling inside in a way that maybe I wasn't even able to articulate and it helps me work through what I'm working through. Right. You know, so I think that, that's wonderfully valuable. I, you know, I don't know that everybody can do that. Mm-hmm. You know, not everybody can act, can not everybody's a musician, not everybody's a painter, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but I think that's the value of art. You know, art is, I think has a, a profoundly valuable place in our, in our society for that reason. Right. You know, so. And I hear a lot of people say things like that. And what's weird is the contrast between, okay, this is important. If you look in history, look at the Renaissance, like there has been, it has been times in history where 
people, societies have been changed because of the focus mm-hmm. on things like that. Yeah. But then you look at schools and they're like, eh, we can cut the arts. We can cut yeah. the music classes. Yeah. Why do you think that's a thing? Well, you know, I think we're living in this society now that, um, you know, and you know, my vocation is actually is math and physics. So right. essentially I'm a scientist is what I really am. We're talking about acting, but, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I will say that, you know, yes, if you look at, um, at the world in the 20th century, I mean, you know, science and technology has, has had a profound impact over mm-hmm. the last hundred years. And, and, you know, it's not slowing down. In fact, I think, you know, sometime, you know, 500 years from now, when people look back and they say, you know, what was the century that really began the transformation to how we live now, mm-hmm. you know, 500 years from now, um, and how they lived back in, you know, horse and buggy day, mm-hmm. it won't be the 20th century. I think it'll be the 21st century. Okay. Um, so the 20th century then will look like it was just the foothills, right. you know? And so there's so much change going on and it's so powerful and it's so important um, that, you know, nations, they just, they feel like, look, we've got to train scientists. We, this is, it's running everything. Modern technology and science is running everything. Right. Okay. And we have to have people who know what they're doing and everything. And so there is a focus on it, I think, because of that. That makes you sense. Know, it, you know, but at the same time, you know, there was a, a film, I can never remember the name of movies that really move me, but um, <laughs> Richard Dreyfus played the leading role and he was a musician and he ended up taking a job at a high school as like a band teacher, you know, because that's what most artists do. Yeah. <laughs> they have to do something to make a living, you right. know? And uh, so he was only, he was writing this, uh, it was Mr. Holland's Opus. Mm. That's was the name of it. And he was trying yeah, to write this. Yeah, I wouldn't this. have remembered that. All right. So he was trying to write this wonderful opus and he, you know, but he takes a job as a band teacher and, and then he has a son who's deaf, mm. which makes it very hard for him to connect. So the movie was all about that kind of stuff. But, um, but it, there was this one scene uh, where they were doing that. They were cutting all of these art programs, you know, and the principal that he was having an argument with the principal and the principal said, you know, but look, I'm sorry, we just have to focus, you know, on, on reading and writing. And he, and Dreyfus's character said to him, he said, look, he said, I understand that. But he said, if you keep cutting these programs, you're going to get to a place where there's nothing worth writing about, you know, and that's, that that's yeah. so true, you know. I mean, because the art gives expression to life and to what makes life important, right. you know. And and even as a scientist, I'll say, look, I mean, science and technology is is wonderful, um, but it, at the end of the day, it's really just a tool that we have used to make life better, and it has absolutely done that. But if 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 it's going to take away from the expression of what life is you know, that, that's no good. Right. We, we can't allow that, you know? So Oof, that gets pretty deep, especially yeah. because that war, I mean, I've heard, and we've talked a lot about things that eventually you start talking. And I'm like, I don't know how to comprehend these things. Cause I'm not mm-hmm. super good at math. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, um, you've the thing about being, cause you are creative and that's, what's interesting mm-hmm. about being somebody who's very into math, which is like very logic based, very yeah. like this and this is this. And I think I've asked you this question before. Do you feel like we're going to discover new math? Is there like another oh, layer? Yeah. And well, in fact, um, all of the math, um, that has been invented in the history of the world. Okay more than half of it has been invented in the last 100 years. Really? Yeah. So when you, you know, right now you go back to, um, to the days of Isaac Newton, you know, and, and see, he basically invented calculus along with some other people. Leibniz was another guy, but so, you know, what, I mean, calculus was a, uh, was a huge transition. It was a huge breaking point. Um, because once you have the mathematics of calculus, uh, along with Newton's three laws of motion, you basically have everything you need for the industrial revolution. Okay. Okay. And before that you did not. Okay. So there was no way to have the industrial revolution without calculus and without, um, Newton's three laws. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but so since then, you know, the amount that we have moved forward, 
uh, mathematically has been huge. And, and what happens is that we invent math to try and describe the things that we're discovering about our reality. You mm -hmm. know, so, so the big things, probably the two biggest things would be in modern physics would be um, Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. So those two things n literally sort of needed some new math, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so as we develop math, we're doing it to try and describe those things. And it's interesting because in math, what we do is there's a saying, they, they ask this question, is math invented or discovered? Mm. And, and the answer is that it's both. So, you know, we, we begin with the, the de, we make the definitions. Okay. So we say, here's an integer. It's a whole number, you know, and we come up negative numbers mean this, and we give expression in terms of a very, very precise definition. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then we go, we start doing mathematics based on these definitions that we have laid out. So we laid out the rules, but then when we start doing the math based on those rules, it takes us to places where we discover things that are true that we had no idea were true. Right. Um, I mean, there was just not even, I mean, completely, completely unintuitive. Um, nobody would have ever guessed, not at all obvious at all. And, but these things have to be true um, based on the definitions. And so what happens is when you base these definitions and you're, you're trying to describe our reality. And so you have these definitions, here's what has to be true. And they start with these very, very basic, I mean, the axioms of mathematics are, mathematics are unbelievably basic. I mean, you would look at them and you would think, oh, of course, that's obvious. You right. know? And just starting from there, though, you, you discover these truths that nobody would have thought of. And, and lo and behold, they describe the universe unbelievably well. And, and that's the discovery part. Okay. So um, and, and it's really, really, pro it's a profound journey and it's it's hard to explain to somebody if you haven't experienced it mm -hmm. it's really hard to express what it's like um to feel like you've discovered a truth L literally no human being i mean mathematicians do that they discover a truth they prove a theorem that at that moment no human being in the history of the world has ever known except them yeah. at that moment until they publish it you know That's so crazy yeah right. so you said a uh, a word that i've We've had discussions with people about quantum mechanics before, mm -hmm. and you get the people who are like, oh yeah, I got it all figured out. This is how yeah, it works. Yeah, they're lying. <laughs> okay, yeah. so why, why, <laughs> <laughs> why is that something that, like it's pseudoscience, the people who say they have it figured yes, out. Yes, th that's right. So why, ha why has that grown? Why is that so popular? And when you say, scientists and mathematicians literally try to say like, no, no, thank you. Because that world is almost like a black hole where it's like, yeah. how, like in physics, they, they say it's the skeleton in the closet of physics. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So why has it grown? Why has the whole, this is how it works. There's energies around you and you know, blah, blah, blah. Like there's people yeah. who literally will tell you this is how it works. And they're not at all. They don't have right. any sort of science I, background. Right. Can I cut in for just, yeah. yes. I think the problem is when you take quantum mechanics and you turn it into self-help. Oh yeah. That's right. I think that's where yeah. it becomes hairy. I think, yeah. you know, you can talk about quantum mechanics and that's fine. But when it becomes interlaced with self-help and this is how things work. Yes. So this is, you can right. predict your, you know, project your own yeah. universe and all that stuff yeah. is where it gets weird. But yeah. why has that grown? Why hasn't that just been laughed away? Like that's ridiculous. Don't do well, that. Well, because there is this sort of, there is like this kernel of truth to it. Okay. So the thing about quantum mechanics is, um, it is very, very mysterious. So it, it, the, the mathematics of it and its description of reality, um, it, it is literally the most successful theory we have ever come up with. I mean, it has basically never failed a prediction and we're talking about, you know, precision out to like the 19th decimal place, yeah. you know, it's, it's unbelievably accurate. Um, and so there is a very real sense in which, you know, the science itself sort of can't be just wrong. Um, it would be, um, I mean, there's maybe more to the story. And right. I think most people actually agree with that because the big problem in physics today is that you still can't really marry quantum mechanics with general relativity. They don't seem to play together nicely. Mm. And they, you, when you try to do it in areas that you need to do it, 
which has to do with black holes. You know, that's one area. Um, you get these crazy expressions that say four is equal to infinity, the <laughs> things that can't be true. And so that's one of the things, it's called the grand unified theory. People are trying to find ways to make them mm. work together. String theory makes them work together, but then it has its own problems because it sort of predicts everything. And like it just, if you just tweak the strings, you can get any universe. Yeah. And so that's, you know, um, so that's why people have problems with that. But so in quantum mechanics, here's the big issue. It's called the measurement problem. Okay. So what happens is um, essentially when you go to do experiments uh, with particles at, at the atomic level, um, what happens is they behave one way when you look and they behave another way when you don't look. So it's as if, um, it's as if they know when you're looking. Okay. <laughs> I remember it's the like, first time I heard right. that, I was like, oh, what? <laughs> right. And, and what's really bizarre, I mean, so the, the big experiment that everyone points to, it's called the double slit experiment. So you fire these, um, you know, if you fire a light through two slits and then you let it land on a screen behind you, it, the, the energy of light is a wave. And so when it goes through those two slits, as it emerges on the other side, it's like two sources of light. And as it expands out in a sphere, the waves of the light interfere with each other. And when they interfere constructively, they create more light. And when they interfere destructively, they flatten out. So you can think of water waves. If, if the crest of one wave hits the peak of another wave, they just flatten out, right? Mm -hmm. So where that happens, you get no light on the back screen and where they, in, they strengthen each other, um, you get more light, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so they interfere in such a way that it creates this interference pattern on okay. that screen. So then people have the idea of, well, let's do this with particles. You know, instead of photons, little waves of light, let's put throw electrons through there. Mm -hmm. So when they did that, they got the same interference pattern. They said, well, gosh, how are particles doing that? Because particles aren't waves. We think of little balls, right? right? And they thought, well, maybe it's because, uh, yeah, we've got a picture of it up there. Yeah. Very so they nice. thought, well, maybe it's like a crowd moving through tour. It's like a, some, it's, it's a wave as they come through, they just kind of bump into each other and they create it. So then they had the bright idea of just doing like one electron at a time. Mm. Right. And so it's got to go through one or the other and just create like a little dot of light on the screen that it hits behind that little bar that it went through. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so when they did that, okay, it still created an interference pattern. So how does one at a time create an interference pattern, right? right? So then they basically, without going into the technical detail, they basically said, well, let's watch. And so they set up a way to watch. Well, when they looked and they watched, well, then it just went through one slit at a time and it, it just created one little point of light and, and you got two little bars of light mm -hmm. on the screen. That's it, like what they expected would happen. Right. But then when they didn't look again and ran the experiment, it would create an interference pattern again, right? So strange. It's bizarre. And so, and they have done variations on that where you can literally, you can send like the particles, not just electrons. I mean, they, they even do this with what's called buckyballs or big giant like uh, molecules that can almost be the size of a dust particle, right? Mm. And it still does that. And they can do things where they trap a particle, they'll send it through, uh, you know, a, a maze where it has to go in one box or the other box and they can make it bounce around in that box, right? And then they can just open the doors of the two boxes and let it come flying out. Well, if they do one at a time and they don't look to see which box it's in mm -hmm. and they open those doors and they keep doing that, you'll create an interference pattern. Interesting. Okay, but if you look to see which box it's in, you have a 50-50 chance of being right. And so let's say you look in this box over here, well, it's not there. Well, that means you know it's in the other box. Right. But now the just the fact that you know it's in the other box, when you open the two boxes, you get just a dot of light coming out of that box. It's so weird. And there's and there's the thing is is the times when you look at the other box and it's not in there, you've done it in a way that there's no physical way you could have affected anything right. in this other box. And yet now it's like the universe knows to just, well, they, they know, they know it's like the universe said, Oh, they, he looked at me, he knows my deal. So I've got to act this way now. Right. You know? And, but if there's not looking, I can just be an interference pattern and, you know, and so, um, and they so can what, even, it's, it's totally what is bizarre. That? Why? No one understands that. <laughs> I mean, literally nobody understands why that happens. Okay. Um, but here's the thing, okay, and so just to quash all the craziness out there, so what happens is that people, they say, well, so there's something about consciousness. Yeah, or awareness. Right, or, yeah. or awareness. And, and to be honest, I agree with that. I, I think, in fact, now there are people saying, look, we were thinking that consciousness must be some, it's some foundational 
element of reality. It's not an emergent property. So consciousness mm -hmm. doesn't arise from the laws of physics. It's not mass energy and it, it's part of it's part of the fabric of reality. Um, and it's just an illusion. It feels like it's an emergent property, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So that has profound implications for philosophy and religion, whatever. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, okay? When that happens, you know, and you, you do the double slit experiment or whatever. Okay. So when you're watching or you're not watching, it's not like, it's not as if you have control. In other words, when you're looking, it's still just a 50, 50 chance, or you capture your, your, um, your particle in those boxes or whatever. It's not like when you look, it's just a 50, 50 chance as to which box it will be in. Right. Okay. Um, and it's the same thing with entanglement. That's another big issue, another mystery. Um, two particles, no matter how far apart they are, if they've, if they've been in proximity, proximity to each other, once they're far apart, you can do something to this particle that instantly affects this particle. That was and, another thing I heard that yeah. I'm like, why? <laughs> right, and no one understands that. So here's a good analogy for that, okay? It would be like, let's say you and I are, are 10 light years apart, you know, on two different planets, and, um, and we both know, you know, at a certain time of day or whatever, we have, we have already synchronized our watches and we're gonna, you know, flip a coin, all right? And so you start flipping your coin and I start flipping my coin, right? And it's just heads or tails, right? And after 10,000 flips, the law of large numbers, you get very close to, you know, 50% heads and 50% tails, mm -hmm. you know, just like you would expect. And so do I. So the same thing happens. All right. It just seems like, yeah, 50, 50, that's what happens. But then you and I come together and we compare nodes. And what we discover is that every single time you got heads, I got tails. Mm. And every time I got heads, you got tails. That's what entanglement's like. So, so there's no way of sending information because it's still you can't control that. Right. You, so your consciousness isn't controlling whether you get heads or tails. It's just something about the universe that says, okay, but it's got to be this way. Yeah. So, so it does seem like there's something about awareness that will make the universe behave one way in terms of another way, but you're not in control of that behavior. Right. And so that's what people like to say. They like to say, well, there's something about consciousness. You know, if you just you know, if you envision things or you visualize things, it's like you're forcing the universe to do it your way. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. And there's no evidence from, you know, from quantum mechanics that that's the case. Right. Now, um, anecdotally, well, first, okay, I love that. And I really want to keep talking about that. Okay. I want to talk about what happens when people, because there are people like the secret and, you know, yeah, all right. that, where it's yeah, like, yeah. if I just put this thought out, then it will happen. But real quick, that idea, I think was in um, another earth. Is that accurate? Britt Marling? Um... So another Earth. I'd have to think about that. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> yeah, another Earth answer. is basically this amazing movie. It was done on like a hundred thousand dollar budget. Like yeah. it's a sci-fi movie right. that is like mentally sci-fi. Like it's oh, it's so amazing. Britt Marling yeah. is wonderful, but this movie is basically this other Earth is discovered in the sky. Mm -hmm. So it's like a moon almost. So you yeah, see right. it, and you're like, that's another. Earth, Earth yeah, planet. okay, yeah. And so, yeah, oh, I love it. Everybody needs there to watch is. this movie. Britt yeah. Marling is absolutely amazing. Yeah, I'm gonna watch it today, actually. Yeah, <laughs> oh, you really, my interest. You, it's so yeah. interesting, but so basically in this movie, she, they, they say like, you have another version of yourself on this other Earth, yeah. and like, when you look this way, it looks the other way. So it's kind of that idea, right. like, like we were saying, if I get heads, you get tails. Yeah, right. And just the plot that they play out is so interesting in that. But the idea, so imagine if you did come across an, another version of yourself and they yeah. did the opposite of what you did yeah. to see if your lives would be in sync yeah. in any sort of way. Yeah. That's yeah. always interesting. But let's go back to the quantum mechanics thing. Yeah. So what do you say to the people who wholeheartedly believe? Because this can be true for some people who thought, I just started thinking positively. I started visualizing. And there's people who literally will tell you 100% this is true. You visualize like I want money and I want my YouTube channel to grow. And suddenly it did. And they have yeah. these stories that are anecdotes, but there seems to be some sort of mm -hmm. pull. There's some sort of a following that says, yeah, that's true. Let's do it. And I've, oh, it's changed my life. We got a huge old airplane flying above. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> low flying plane for sure. Yeah. So why is that like placebo effect? What do you no, think? No, I, I think that there's a real effect there, but I think it's a natural effect. Okay. You know? So so for example, you know, um, let's take someone who's pessimistic as opposed to being optimistic. Okay? okay. So when you're, I think a pessimistic person is likely to see the challenges that an enterprise would present you with and not see the opportunities. 
Okay, so they see the challenges, but not the opportunities. Okay, so let's take a person who's they're, they're trying to do something, and someone says, "You just got to start thinking positively," or they go to some like the secret place, and you got to envision Tony it. Robbins. Hey, or- yeah, you got you got to start thinking positively. And yeah. so let's say somehow they they do that. You know, well, in the act of doing that, all of a sudden they just naturally see opportunities that they didn't see before. Okay, and so then they act on those, and and of course, if you take advantage of opportunities that you just didn't notice before things are going to happen differently you know right. i knew a guy who was uh he helped people in recovery and he said he said if you want if you want something different than you've ever had you're probably going to have to do something different than you've ever done mm-hmm. and I, and that's true i mean yeah. and so if, if people can just change their mindset about something which obviously you know envisioning things thinking positively i mean of course yeah, that's going to make a difference. And and things are going to, to take place, you know, because you were looking at the world differently and you saw things that you didn't see before. Mm-hmm. But I think that's just a natural effect. Of course, that's going to happen. Right. You know? It's not um, as magical or mystical like, oh, something. Right. This yeah. In front of right. Me. It wasn't it wasn't quantum mechanics <laughs> that made your YouTube channel <laughs> blow up. <laughs> right. You know, so. um Right. You know, and, and, you know, and here's the thing. And I have a problem with those people also, because um, the reality is, is um, that our world, you know, quantum mechanics is actually the foundation of it is probability. It's a probabilistic um, thing. Okay. That wave pattern is a probability wave mathematically. And that's the wave that's interfering with itself. That's why it's so mysterious. It's mm-hmm. that's a mathematical construct that we came up with with reality. But suddenly, it's like that wave is. How do you have a probability wave? What mm-hmm. does that mean? Mm-hmm. You know. So it is. It's absolutely you know mysterious. Um, but the reality is, is that life is full of randomness um, that we're not in control of. Totally. Wait, and is it randomness or just stuff that we're not in control of? That's like well, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, it's definitely stuff that we're not in control of, and it's definitely stuff that, in the mathematics of statistics and probability, we can predict with that level of probability. So when you flip a coin, yeah, you're going to get mostly fifty-fifty. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, so the reality is, is, is that when you can look at something and you can gather a bunch of data that says, hey, you know, eighty-five percent of the time this is what happens. Well, guess what? When you set up something that takes advantage of that situation, guess what? 85% of the time, right. you know, so, um, you know, and that happens, you know, in music, we're talking about acting and, and art, you know, um, it, the reality is, is that this, to me, this is the sad thing about art is that so many people just, it's just background for them, you know, yeah. like music, you know, so you go, we're here in Sarasota, you know, if you go to the Siesta Key Oyster Bar, gosh, man, you've seen really, some really good bands, yeah. you know, that play there. And those guys are playing like for almost free, you know? Yeah. And it's because so many people just sort of ignore and it takes a lot of talent to do that. And the sad thing about art is that there are just thousands of people who are really good and really talented and they're, they're not even able to make a living at it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter how positively they think. It doesn't matter. None of that matters, you know? Um, and there are just thousands, millions even that never, ever, ever make it. Mm-hmm. And it, the same is true, you know, even more sadly, you know, in, in third world countries and places like that, you know, it doesn't matter what those people people do. They can't think themselves out of poverty. They can't, they can't think positively and say, Oh, well, you know, Hey, if I just think positively, you know, guess what, you know, a a year from now I'll be a millionaire. That's not going to happen. Right. And, um, and that's the kind of thing that, you know, when people like that say, Oh, it's just all just a matter of your perspective. And it's just, no, it's not. No, it's not. I mean, we really are constrained by the laws of physics in this world, and there are things that are possible and not possible. Mm -hmm. Um, And people can find themselves in situations um, that are impossible. Right. Now, at the risk of like sparking some nihilism, um, the I mean, everybody kind of knows in the entertainment world, like you can't just sit there and say, I'm going to be a movie star and then become one. Right. Like, even the whole like work as hard as you possibly can and be talented and That's go right. and be in the right places and have these opportunities. Right. But really what I see it as is like, there's kind of not a puppet master. That sounds really like big and scary, but there yeah. are, there are people at the top that literally it's one of those things where if they come across you and you just so happen to fit that role that they're trying to fill. Sure. 
and all these other factors come into play, then you'll have a shot. That's right. At some sort of big fame. So then if the reality is, okay, there's going to be millions of people like you, all the people out there who want to be big, um, that aren't going to make it. And maybe they're more talented than you, but they're not still not going to make it. Okay. What, what do you do? Do you just give up? Do you stop? So like what, you know, (laughs) I I mean, I guess my philosophy on that is, you know, I I think people have to do the things that, that fulfill them. I think it was, uh, um, who was it? Abraham Maslow. He had his hierarchy of need, you know, Mm -hmm. you got to have food and water first, you know, you can't think about anything else. You have that and you go on up and his top thing was self-actualization. You know, he said a writer has to write, you know, a musician. So, you know, I think that you've got to find a way to do those things. And it, you know, if you can't make a living at it, um, you got to find a way to do those things just for your own fulfillment, you know? Mm So, you know, I, I, I used to be in a band, you know, and we wanted to be rock stars. And, you know, I, I just, I say to musicians today, I say, look, if, if what you're doing all this for is because you want to become famous, rich and famous, you know, and be today, whatever today's version of a rock star is, you know, or you want to be the next Beyonce or whatever, um, you know, honestly, you should probably just quit. Yeah, you should just give up because the, no matter how talented you are, the chances that you're going to be the next Beyonce, even if you're a better singer than her and better looking than her, mm-hmm. the chances that that you're going to have any fame at all is next to none. Yeah. Almost zero, okay? Um, but if it's what fulfills you, then I think you should find a way to do it, you know, even if you can't make a living at it. And, and you know, I don't know, keep trying. Sure. Why not? You know, mm-hmm. if you can, if you want to live in Hollywood and whatever, and you're okay with, um, waiting tables, you know, whatever, 30 hours a week, and then going on shoots and, and finding ways to play in local theater because that fulfills you and, you, and you're okay with that life, then live that life, mm-hmm. you know, but you know, I, I just, I feel like, you know, look for what the real value is. The real value right. is the acting right. or the playing of the music. That's the real value. And if you, if you lean into that and you live out your, um, your talent and you express yourself, I believe that you'll be a blessing to somebody. Yeah. Some, you know, it, even if it's just playing at your friend's wedding or, you know, at parties for people who you're friends of yours and you, you'll, you'll be a blessing to somebody and Mm -hmm. it'll enrich your life, you know? So, so look for that, do that, you know? So I wouldn't say give up on, on it. Just quit trying, don't try and make it a thing where it's okay. I want to do this to be famous. You know? Right. I think the why is that really, really important thing. And I, I love the idea of self actualization. So is that the the word? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that you basically, and that's, there's a lot of people who kind of hint at that as like, what do I do with my life? And it's like, nobody should really tell you that that's something that you do have to discover for yourself. And it's not like once you pick it, then it's, and you start to feel like you're not being fulfilled. Then it's like, well, this is the thing I picked. There's reasons why people in their fifties change careers completely. And they just do something completely different because they realize if let's say if, because that's all, you know, if this is your, your one life and your time, your clock is ticking, why not do the thing? Why not make the most of it? And not just in the sense of make the most of it to be famous, make the most of it to be whatever society says is good. But like what Jordan Peterson says, it's like, you got to find something that gives you meaning. You have to find that meaning. Yeah. Even if it's literally you sitting by yourself, making a piece of art that nobody will see until long after you're gone. If you feel like you're doing something meaningful for you and that why is not, well, hopefully somebody will see it and I'll get famous one day. It's just, I'm doing this because this is in me and I need it to come out. I need it to just right. be and to exist. And a lot of times creating something gives people meaning. And that's like, and even doing the mundane things where like working in a factory where you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Yeah, right. I would say those people, if they find something else that fulfills them, maybe that thing over and over again does fulfill them. But if they find something, yeah, yeah. (laughs) but there are people who, who do those things and they listen to podcasts the whole time. And so they're, they're educating themselves, which that's finding meaning. Sure. So it's like, you can find creative, at least enriching yourself. Exactly. And you can, you can find these ways to, I guess the thing is just make the most of it. Like, yeah. If- well, I t- this, this is like touching on a subject that I'm actually pretty passionate about okay. because a few moments ago we, we said, you know, look, yeah, you're not going to be able to just to th- 
think your way out of, of you know, um, abject poverty if you live in a third world nation, right. you know. Um, and even here in America, you know, the, the reality is, is that, yeah, it's for a lot of people, it's very, very hard for them to, to do this, to express themselves or to do the thing that would really enrich them because we live in this somewhat shallow society right. um, where that, you know, pretty much money runs everything. Yeah. Okay. And so you have to just survive, you know, you have to find a way to just earn enough money to pay the rent to, you know, to do these things. And a lot of people find themselves in a situation where that takes up all of their time right. and they're in this meaningless dead end job where they have to work, you know, 60 hours a week, you know, so what are they, so take a musician, you know, maybe he's really talented, but if he never went to college or whatever, and so now he's got a job working construction and in order to feed his family, he's got a wife and two kids, he has to work 60 hours a week. Well, that doesn't leave a lot of time for writing songs, even right. just to fulfill himself, you right. know? Um, and, and so this whole business of, well, if you just, you know, think positively, well, you know, that's crap. That's just BS, <laughs> you know, but here's what is true. What is true is that that the collective consciousness of humanity if all of us, if we could all get on the same page about what we want our world to be we're finally at a place in human history and this is i think where the the science and technology is really important we're finally at a place in history where that we could bring about a world that it would be almost like a utopia. I think we're at a place where we could do that if everybody got on the same page. And there are things that we would have to accomplish to do that. But we're at the cusp of um, a place where, you know, for example, fusion energy, we're right on the cusp of that. You know, that would, when we finish that, when we are able to do that, that's going to radically change everything. Because in economics, at the end of the day, what you're paying for is the energy cost right. to create whatever it was right? right so when energy is basically free and fusion would create that reality um you know the cost of every, everything would come down and so forth um artificial intelligence is getting to the place where it's going to pretty much do the menial jobs you know um so but then what are we going to do for the people who get paid doing those menial jobs well it seems to me that if we could just get on the same page and say look let's find a way to make the world a place where it's not all about money. It's not all about who has the most power and the most prestige and the most fame. And, and mostly people with the most money have the most power. You know, right. if we could get past that and say, you know, let's get to a place where that's not how it is. Let's get to the place where, where there is not a single person on this planet that ever needs to go hungry. We've got that covered. You know, let's get to a place where there's no one that ever has to go without health, basic health care. And in years to come, who knows what that means? I mean, you know, cures for every kind of disease, stem cell therapies are unbelievable right now. And we're just getting to a place where that that no one should have to live that way. Right. You know, and let's get the world to that place where that every human being who lives has the opportunity to express themselves and to be the person the best person that they could be um, with regard to whatever they're gifted at. You know, if it's, if they're kind of a left brain person, maybe it's science and technology, they pr help progress that, mm -hmm. you know, which is the foundation of allowing people to live more freely and have more time, you know, for the artistic people to, you know, put their stuff up on YouTube and whatever, you yeah. know, but, the, but then there's like this world where everybody is able to express themselves and nobody has to eke out a meager existence spending all of their time just surviving. Right. You know, um, so you definitely described it the right way by saying utopia and the way that I, I, I would I, obviously I agree. I, I would love yeah. for that to be a thing. What, like it's so difficult just because in order for a lot of that stuff, like you're saying, get on the same page right now, that's the problem. Right. And yeah. I would say the people who would be the leaders in getting on the same page are the people at the top mm -hmm. who have the money, who have the power, right. who probably won't be. And they like feeling superior. Keen. Exactly. Right. They won't be too keen on like, Oh, free energy. Sure. Right. I'm the oil guy. Yeah, I've right. made my sure. entire, absolutely. You know, right. so do we just wait for those? Do we but wait here, for green you know, to die off? Right, here's, like what? here's the irony of that. Those very same people, you know, it, it, to live in the world that we would live in, in economics, they talk about uh, 
the real wealth, okay? And what they say, what they mean when they say that is they mean real wealth isn't currency, it's what that currency will buy. So, you know, outstanding healthcare, you know, outstanding whatever, you know, more convenience, you know, what's the, the utility, you know, of this thing that you're, per, you know. And so um, people living in the 21st century today, even really poor people have more real wealth than you know, really rich people had 200 years ago. I mean, they didn't have cell phones 200 years. Right. You know, so, so. Um, but the thing is, is the increase in real wealth. If we would all just get on the same page, um, even those people, their increase in wealth would go up. Okay, more than it would if we don't do that. Okay, so if we all got on the same page, we said, hey, yeah, because you know, like with fusion energy, what that would allow then is it would allow us to do experiments that are, that are high energy, they're very intensive in terms of energy, right? Mm -hmm. It would allow us to do the kinds of um, experiments that would allow us to discover new things, new medicines, so forth. Same thing with artificial intelligence. As, as we pour into those things um, and you discover oh gosh, you know what? We now know how to edit DNA to such a degree that all genetically b based diseases are done. Right. We can just edit them out, okay? Um, so when that day comes, this oil tycoon, okay, his son now, you know, if his kid gets cancer or whatever, he, you know, right now, he doesn't, no matter how much money he has, if he gets, let's say, pancreatic cancer, he's done. Right. We can't fix that. Okay. Now in a future, the kind of future I'm talking about where he might have to give up some of his relative wealth compared to everybody else, he gives that up, but he gets more real wealth for himself. He lives right. in a world where if he gets pancreatic cancer, oh, we can cure that, right. you know, and that's a better world for everybody, even the people at the top. And I feel like that the, the so-called people at the top who, by the way, don't recognize how much randomness there was in them getting there. Mm. They don't recognize how much total luck there was in them getting there. Um, and every economist who studies economics n knows that, mm. okay? They, they just like the feeling of being superior. They just feel superior. Right. Um, and they want to hold on to that. And the idea of giving I mean, that I would. Wouldn't sure. you? I, <laughs> You know, I, I think I've, I've kind of come to this place where, you know, I forget who it was who said, he said, every man I meet in some way is my superior, mm. you know, and I think there's some truth to that. And if you can just be okay with whatever your gifts are and see, you know, here's what I'm good at, you know, and, and that's a blessing to the world. And I don't need to think of myself as just being superior, right. you know, I mean, I can just be who I am and be comfortable with that. I, right. I don't know. I, I, just, I do hey, feel like that. Guys, yes. we have another podcast starting in five minutes. So oh, we, we got to wrap right. it up. Okay. okay. So real quick, it, we can, we can end this with, you seem to obviously have thought about this a lot. Yeah. This, this is something that, that yeah. you said you're passionate about. So you say, get on the same page. Right. What is the very first step to getting on the same the page? The very first step would be for average everyday people to educate themselves. Okay. Okay. They, they need to educate themselves particularly. I mean, it would be really good to know more about, about science and technology because most Americans anyway are horribly <laughs> ignorant. I mean, it, and what it, the possibilities there and also about um, economics and also about government. And if they would really educate themselves to just to a little bit in those areas, um, the history of economics and uh, you know, econ, you know, the realities of, of what that is. A few good books that I would recommend. One outstanding book. It's called Thinking Slow and Fast by a, a guy named Daniel Kahneman. Um, I won't go into what it's about, but it, well, it, it's, it's about people's behavior and how we tend to be irrational and we don't know that we're irrational. And so if people could learn how to be rational um, and think rationally, um, and then educate themselves and look into things and be able to do it rationally and and be able to think critically and come to true conclusions about the things that they're looking at, um, we would all come to very similar conclusions because the facts are the facts and the mm -hmm. evidence is the evidence. Um, and if that happened and enough people got on that page, you know, then that would end lobbying in Congress because it wouldn't matter how much money you had to, to do a 30 second soundbite ad if people don't buy into 30 second right. sound bites anymore because they know what the truth is, they're yeah. going to vote for the person who's going to implement the things that they know will, will fix things. And, and that would solve the problem of money in Washington. So people educating themselves for not only their benefit, but for the rest of the world's benefit so that we can right. all get on the same page. That right. would be the number one thing.
Okay. Yeah. I love it. Thanks. Real quick before we go, you start talking about truth and I would love to do another podcast with you about alternative truths like flat oh, earth. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the flatter theory, I think it would be really fun. But if thanks. there's one word that I'm most passionate about in this life, it's truth. That's, okay. that's what I'm passionate about. Truth. So he's so. got tattooed on himself. Awesome. It doesn't mean a whole lot though. <laughs> <laughs> All right guys, we're wrapping this up. Thank thanks you, so Kevin. Thanks. This was so much fun. It was fun. Awesome. Yeah.